Orthodox, I'm chair of the Council of Christians and Jews. I'd like to be the, acknowledge the original custodians of the land at which we meet, the Bunurong people of the Kula Nation, um, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Welcome everyone, thank you for coming. Thank you for giving up your uh, Friday, I think it is Friday morning, um, to hear a wonderful speaker that we have today. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Leslie Sachs, our guest from Israel. Um, you'll notice that she has a South African accent um, when she speaks English at least. Um, I'm, sure it's, I'm sure it's very fluent in Hebrew. Um, and um, she's, not only is she a founder of many organisations and has been president of many Jewish organisations, she's also an artist, an art appreciator, an innovator, um, someone who incubates organisations um, and makes them run and, and, and builds them. Um, and you'll hear a lot about that. I don't want to say too much because what she's going to say will probably be way more fascinating than hearing from me. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Leslie. Thank you. So I was asked to speak today about women in Israel and other minorities. I'm going to start with women and hopefully maybe touch on other minorities. Um, at the end of my, of my presentation, I am going to talk just very briefly about what's happening in Israel now and how it's going to uh, affect uh, the status of women in Israel. So I want to start with three points that I want to ask you to remember uh, all along the, 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 the presentation. The first is that in Israel there's no separation between state and church. Okay, that's really, really important too, because it, 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 it influences everything that has been happening in Israel as far as women since Israel was established. The second is that we don't have a constitution. And the third is that in the Declaration of Independence of Israel from 1948, the Declaration of Independence basically promises uh, gender equality. The word gender didn't exist then, so they talked about uh, equality between the sexes, okay? And also freedom of religion. So that this is, these are things that we need, we need to remember. So in 1948, Israel is, is established. Um, there is a women's uh, party. Uh, you know, the only time that really there was a, a women's party, uh, you know, in, in, in the, our parliament. And um, um, the, when you read things that were written then, the great expectations, um, ideals, socialist ideals, and you kind of have that feeling of, oh, there's going to be equality. And that's part of a myth that um, a lot of people um, have, have had for many years about Israel. Um, I, I, I want to say that at the same time of the, the, those feelings of, uh, of, of hope and, you know, how, how Israel should look in the future, there is a status quo between the orthodox and, 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 and the secular establishment government. And that agreement uh, between, between those two groups um, really harm women in so many ways and we're going to see it it's 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 a line that goes through the, the whole history since 1948 and until until now um, in 1951 there's legislation of a very important law uh, for um, equal rights for women it is a very advanced law and it, it, it promises a lot of the rights that women have had since then. Um, the only snag in that law, and it is in all, also in all the international uh, agreements that Israel signs that are connected to women's rights, in brackets, it says, except for issues of marriage and divorce. Okay, so equality except for issues of marriage and divorce. This is a big issue, a big issue. When I uh, joined the Israel Women's Network in, in uh, 1989, it had, it had been founded a few years earlier, and it subsequently became the most important women's organization because it was the first one that, that decided to work on, uh, on litigation and legislation. It wasn't a grassroots organization. It had women from all the political parties in it, and and 
it, it was founded by a, a really amazing woman called Professor Alice Shalvey, who subsequently uh, got the Israel Prize, a very prestigious prize, for her feminist work. She was a, a professor of, uh, of English literature, an expert in Shakespeare. She was an educator. Um, she, she's still with us. She's 94 and, and still saying to me, Leslie, we have to change things. Let's fight for it. What are you going to do now? Um, and she, uh, before she really founded the organization, she went around Israel to find out what women cared about, what was the main thing that worried them. And she thought probably, she's, this, is, this is 19, I don't know, 88. She, probably it would be violence against women, so, you know, equal pay, something like that. The main issue that everybody said need to be changed was divorce, the rabbinical courts. That was the main thing that, that women all over Israel had one way or another had the experience of uh, the bad experience of, of going through, um, whether themselves or someone in their families. And just a few words about the, the rabbinical courts. These are, are courts where only men uh, preside, okay? These are ultra-Orthodox men, Hasidic, ultra-Orthodox, who don't really know any much about the secular world and certainly not about women because, you know, there's complete separation. They know their mothers, their sisters, their wives, maybe their daughters, but not much else. And, and amongst other things, women are are not eligible for testifying in a rabbinical court. They, they can't really, they te they, if, if their testimony, testimony is not acceptable. So in advance, you, you come into the rabbinical courts from a, a, a situation of, of you know, a, a, that, that, that in advance, you're not gonna win anything. You, you, you're gonna lose no matter what. And, um, Another thing to remember in Judaism, the man, if you want to get divorced, the man has to physically give you a, a piece of paper of, of divorce. So you can't get divorced if the man doesn't want to get divorced. You will stay married. You will stay an anchored woman, an aguna, or mukevet get, an aguna is a, a woman whose husband has vanished. But we, t we talk about it in, in those words, you remain an anchored woman. Now, what happens in the, in the rabbinic courts is that, you know, in divorce, there's a lot of bad feelings and even good men uh, are angry. And, and what happens is that they, uh, they uh, <coughs> say, we'll give you an, a, a divorce if, if you give me the house, if you give up the money, if you give up the children, whatever. And, and women go through the rabbinic, rabbinic courts and they can, they can really um, go through hell uh, in the rabbinic courts. So, so, and there is no other way to get married in Israel. You, if you're Jewish, you have to get married through the rabbinical courts. If you're Christian, you get married through, through the church, Muslim with the, you know, through the Kadi. But it's the only way to get married. So more and more Israelis go to Cyprus. We are a very important uh, part of Cyprus's, uh, you know, national uh, budget because thousands of Israelis come and get married in, in Cyprus. The mayor of, uh, of uh, whatever there, he gives you a, a, a key holder that says Mazal Tov and, and he marries you. And the only thing is that they come back to Israel and it is recognized marriage from other countries are, ma ma are, are recognized, civil marriages. But if you want to get divorced, you go through the rabbinic court. If you have, you have married in Cyprus or America, Australia, you know, by the mayor or whoever can marry you, you get divorced in Israel. If you're a Jew married to a Jew, you have to go through the rabbinic courts. And, and uh, I can tell you my, my daughter and her uh, husband, they got married with a reform rabbi because we're reform. 
And it is not recognized by Israel. Reform, conservative marriages are not recognized. And she and her husband, she said, we're going to go to uh, Cyprus. And I said, why? Why go to Cyprus? You know, you can, you know, register as, um, you know, uh, partners, uh, you know, and, and have an agreement and so on. Why would you want to go to Cyprus so that, God forbid, if you ever got divorced, you have to go to the rabbinical courts? So this is just to give you the, the idea why, why it's so important, this issue of, of the rabbinical courts. Now, according to, uh, to law in Israel, the rabbinical courts until today, and this is going to change and I'll talk about it towards the end, can only deal with issues of um, marriage, divorce, custody, and even money if you decide you want to discuss the, the settlement of divorce in a civil court and come to the rabbinical court with the agreement from the civil court, that's okay. That, that, you know, you, could, you can do that. So, so this is already a big, a big problem. I want to talk a bit about the myths. I remember when I, I started being an active feminist, uh, when I finished my army service, I, I was in the army for two years, and and it, what what really struck me uh, and and changed my life in in so many ways was was the way the army was structured. All the women, it was a complete pyramid. All the and all the women, all the women soldiers were right at the bottom, giving services to. The, the fighting core, the, the, the important guys, the, and all the high rank officers were all men. There was just no way you could move up as, as, a, as a woman soldier. So many uh, positions were close to you. I had the most boring <laughs> two years uh, of, of my life, and there was so much also sexual harassment there, and you couldn't do anything about it. It was not good. And I always say, when I went into the army um, from high school, I didn't even know anything about feminism, but I came out and I discovered feminism and I understood that something had to change and I decided to dedicate my, my, my life to, to doing that so that the next generations would have a different experience. And this brings me to an, another point, and that is uh, the court, the Supreme Court in Israel and the courts in, in general. And again, I'll be talking about later on a few words about what's happening now. They have been the defenders of women and other minorities since 1948. We have won the most important battles in the Supreme Court. And I want to tell you about one of them, which is connected to the army service that I had. And so that's why I'm going to put it in right now. So a young woman, came, when I was the executive director of the Israel Women's Network, it must have been 93, 94, I don't remember the year exactly. Um, a young woman um, came to us. Her name was, is Alice Miller. And she wanted to be a pilot in the IDF, in the Israel Defense Force. Um, and she had all the qualifications. She already had a pilot, a pilot license. She was interested in aeronautics and she'd already studied it at, at the Technion, uh, you know, for, for in, the high, in high school and another year afterwards. And she wanted just to go through the exams, you know, when you, then you have to be tested, to be, and the army wouldn't uh, allow it. And we took, a, we took this case to the Supreme Court um, and we have quite a lot of women judges in, in, in Israel, in, uh, uh, also in the Supreme Court. But the unanimous decision there was that the army had to open up to women. That decision changed Israel in ways that, that um, uh, you know, we, we, we only history, history will really be able to judge. Because army service is so important in Israel. Nearly everybody goes to the army. Okay, the ultra-Orthodox don't go, and, but, but most Israelis, they have that experience. And when you're an 18-year-old and you have an experience of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, being unimportant and, 
you're, you would, the work that you're doing is, is just the, the lowest of the low and, and, and you can't ever move up and there's not even a glass ceiling because it's, it's concrete, you know, you don't even see what's up there. That, and you suffer sexual harassment. That influences your whole life, those experiences. Uh, two years is a long time. And, and so the moment we change that, and slowly, the moment, the moment the Supreme Court gave a verdict that the Air Force had to make sure that she can go through the exams, and should she pass, they have to make sure that she can join the, the, the Air Force as a pilot, okay? The moment that verdict came out, it was basically, they were saying, and it was even written, that the the Israeli Defense Force, as the army of the people, you know, has to uh, be uh, have uh, have equal access to all positions unless they can prove that it's a position that that you know because we look different and um you know we, we can't do it, and it opened up the army completely, and there's a story that I, that I tell that that I had to keep as a secret for for quite a long time, maybe. A year and a half, or two years after this verdict, I got a phone call from the head of the border police. And he asked to meet with me and I met with him. Off the record, nobody knew about it until years later that I could tell. And he said to me, listen, since the uh, uh, Supreme Court verdict of Alice Miller, I, the, the border police has changed for the good because I've been getting women, they've been, they are the best, the best material, best, you know, I've, I've ever had. And the border police in Israel was always really not a very exciting core. Nobody wanted to go. But now suddenly it was different. He said, but what happens is that when the women want to become officers, the training of the officers for the border police is in a place called Badi Khad and it's only guys can go there. So if you want to become an officer and you're in the border police, you can, but then they move you to become a, an officer of something else, of administration, of whatever. So all we had to do was write a letter to the army and say, you know, if you don't comply, we're going to have to go back to court. You have to turn Badekhad, that place where they train the fighters, and you have to turn it into, uh, you know, women and men. And they did. And they did. And today, virtually every position in the army is open for women. This is so important because your army service in Israel goes with you. So many politicians even you know, they they different ways of, of you know, get, getting into politics. One of them is, you know, starting in the party and working your way up. And another is, we call it parachuting down from the army, from a, from a senior position in the army. And that's why it was so important to open up the IDF to women. So that was one myth, you know, that I grew, that everybody, you know, grew up with abroad, you know, they thought, oh, girls serve in the army in Israel, so there's equality. No, there wasn't. The second is politics. You know, everybody said Golda Meir, you had a woman president, uh, prime minister. She was one. She was one. She certainly wasn't a uh, feminist or she didn't advance women in any way. And it really, we had, so from the first Knesset, where I told you there was a women's party. Since then, there were so few women in politics. So again, there was another myth that it was not true. One area where women have always, you know, Israeli women, compared to other countries that have been in a very good place, is um, all the legislation and uh, regulations regarding um, uh, children uh, ch uh, being pregnant and having children, childbearing, and all that. The reason is not because they want uh, they care for women, but Israel has always wanted to have more children, more you know, wanted more Jews, and so uh, you know, maternity leave. We have we have a three month maternity leave, fully paid by the social security, and then by law you could 
you could have a longer a, a, a take take more time you can you can take up to a year it's not fully paid but you can take up to a year and you can't be dismissed you know also if you're going through IVF you get days off and, and so on and so forth so that area in Israel has always been an area where women have, have really um, been in a good a good place compared to many other countries where women have to um, save up their, their, their holiday days, you know, their vacation so that they could have a child and have, and have some time off. Israel, no. So, so this is one, one area where, where it was good. We also didn't really have a legislation as far as equal pay. For many years, this was something that, again, the Israel Women's Network, the organization, uh, really took to court. Um, another thing was women uh, were forced to retire, for, had to retire at the age of 62. And this woman called Nomi Navo, uh, she was an um, anthropologist and she worked for the Jewish Agency. Now, in academia, when you're 62, you're basically in the height of your profession. And they, they, they made her, you know, they made, made her go out on pension. And so, um, firstly, we took the Jewish agency to court and she, when we won, and also we managed to change the law, uh, the Israel Women's Network, so that women could retire, if they choose, at the age of 67, uh, like men, but they could, could still retire at the age of 62 if they wanted to. And the idea was that so many women hold you know, basically, they've been bringing up the children and working, and so if they want to, when they can financially, they should be allowed to go on pension. But on the other hand, because they've been doing all that, many women don't have enough money in the pension fund to really go on pension at the age of 62. So that, that's another another uh, uh, issue. Um, now. I, I want to I want to say a few words about what's happening uh, today. That, that's kind of a really brief glimpse at at, at the, the 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 history of the status of women in Israel, and and those points where where um, discrimination is inbuilt because of the separation between church, uh, you know, uh, church and state politics and, and uh, religion, I, I, I usually say. Um, a few words about the Israeli um, uh, electoral system, which explains the power of the um, ultra-Orthodox and now Orthodox parties um, on Israeli politics. So, um, a, we have 120 members of Knesset, and um, and you need to have enough votes to have at least two members of Knesset, you know, join. You, if you only have one, if you only have enough votes for one, your party loses the uh, the uh, the votes. Um, we have a, we have a coalition, and unfortunately, we've never really, there are very few Knessets, very few parliaments, where we haven't had to have the two ultra-Orthodox parties in the coalition. And they'll join the left or the right or the middle as long as they get their, um, we say in Hebrew, litrat basal, their, their, their quota of meat, you know, what, what, they, what they want. Um, we're talking about a, a party called uh, Yehadut HaTorah and a party called Shas to ultra-Orthodox parties, they have no women. Yeah, so already we have uh, a Knesset with less women, because yeah, no women in, uh, can run in these two parties. They are not democratic parties. The rabbi who's in charge of the party, he decides who's going to be, um, be running. These are, this is a problem. I don't have to explain why, but so, no matter which Knesset it was, they always had to cater and placate, placate, I think that's the word I'm looking for, these two ultra-Orthodox parties. And 
this is a flaw in, in, in the Israeli uh, political system that has always, always affected women in so many ways. And unfortunately, it's getting much worse. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a few words about, uh, about what's happening now in Israel. So at the moment, we have a, a, a coalition, a government, made out of six parties. All right. The Likud, headed by Netanyahu, is the largest, but they don't have 60, they, don't have, they have 30, uh, 30 places. And you need to have at least 61 in order to have your coalition. And so, unfortunately, he uh, made his coalition with the two ultra-Orthodox parties and another three parties, which are religious as well. Right wing, and when I say right wing, I mean right wing conservative, you know, in their religious uh, thought. They are very messianic. They uh, certainly are anti-LGBTQ, anti-equal rights for women. They believe in the old values of the family. You know these people. You, I'm, I'm sure you have them here. It's the Trump people. It's the evangelists. It's, it's those kinds of people. They are three parties that are in so many ways um, making uh, the tone now in Israel. They are leading the Likud. The people in the Likud themselves are not, uh, not of that persuasion, let's put it like that. But um, Netanyahu is worried about his court case and um, he needs this, this government, he needs this coalition and he is willing to, to give up a lot of our rights. Our, I'm talking now as women, but women and minorities. The judicial reform, which will take away the power of the Supreme Courts, of the courts in general, is detrimental to women's rights. There's, there's no other way I, I, I can say it. Because all of our, so many of our rights that were not embedded, did not exist in the 1951 uh, law for equality of women, we have achieved through the courts. I'm going to tell you now about another very important court case, um, and that is the uh, the segregated buses. I'm sorry, you've heard it, Philip, already more than once. The segregated buses. So the story is that um, a, we have a national bus service, and what they started doing is they started segregating the buses going through the ultra orthodox uh, neighbourhoods. And the women had to sit at the back, and the men sit, sitting in the front. Now, the reform movement in Israel, we have a legal and advocacy arm called IRAC, Israel Religious Action Center, and they went to the Supreme Court. They took the Minister of Transport to the Supreme Court. Now, the, the, uh, that uh, case, the, the appeal to court, was based on a very important uh, law in Israel, and that is a law that you are not permitted to discriminate in giving services. If you are giving services, you cannot say, I, don't, I won't give services to people with a different color of skin, or I won't give services to Arabs or Jews, Muslims, or you can't, you're not permitted to. That, that is against the law. And what we said is, this is what's happening here. There's a discrimination of women, sending them to the back of the bus, and this is against the law. We won. Not only did we, we won, and each bus, when you go into a bus in Israel, there's a, um, uh, in each bus there's uh, uh, something written that's, uh, that says, anyone on this bus can sit anywhere they want. It's there. And even so, it still continued. So what we did was we encouraged women who experienced this bullying, because it's bullying, you know, go to the back of the bus, to sue the drivers in the small claims court, to sue them that they haven't done anything to protect the woman from bullying. And the drivers were paying out of their own pocket because they, you, you know, the bus so the company can't, it's not permitted to pay for them. They were losing and they were paying. So they started saying to each other, listen, you, it's 
something happens, you've got to immediately get up and say, no, anyone can sit wherever they want because you're going to have to pay a couple of thousand shekel. <coughs> so that is another case where the Supreme Court was our defender. Now, in addition, at the moment, in addition to the uh, overall uh, clause and the, the uh, uh, choosing of the, of the judges that you, I'm sure you all heard of that is part of what Netanyahu's government is, is passing now, there is an arsenal of legislation, bad legislation, bad for, for anyone, if you ask me, for, for us as reformed Jews, for women, for minorities, for LGBTQ, and, and how do we know about it? Because in the coalition agreement, they sign, there's a document that is public. And you can see what Netanyahu promised this party and what Netanyahu promised this party and what Netanyahu promised this party. And it's, in addition to money, a lot of money, it's also legislation. That this legislation will pass and this legislation. One of the pieces of legislation that is going to pass is a change to that law of dis uh, that, that forbids discrimination in services. Why? Because the ultra-Orthodox party want segregation. They want to increase the segregation. And they want segregation to be in the buses, but not only. They want to segregate, they want different, uh, the natural springs in Israel. The big fight about the natural, we don't have that many, you know, bathing in them. There'll be days for men and days for women. I promise you that when that happens, there's going to be three times the amount of uh, days for men and, uh, you know. The, the, they want segregation. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, most of the universities in Israel have classes, segregated classes. The reason, this is a few years ago and we fought and we lost, the reason that most of the universities are doing it is financial, firstly, because they get money for more students. But also ideological, because everybody wants the ultra orthodox to work and not live off our taxpayers paying taxes. So, so the only way they will come and study is if the classes are segregated. You might think, but it's not true, because when you ask them, there was a survey that was done among the students themselves, and they say we don't mind studying with with women in the class. It is the rabbis who want this to happen. So now what happens is there are classes that are segregated, like, like here, but there would be a, a, a kind of a, a, a partition in the middle, and the, and the lecturer stands on a, on a table, and he speaks here and here. And I'm saying he, because a woman can't be a lecturer in this class, only, only men, because they, the men don't want to hear women. So, so now the thing is about segregation is segregation cannot be contained. It's like water. It runs. If there is segregation in one place, it will move to another place. And what happens with the universities is when they had the segregation, suddenly they demanded segregation that there be hours for men and women in the libraries and in the canteens. It doesn't stay. And this brings me to the next, the next topic, and that is women of the war. I cannot but uh, talk about women of the war, uh, but I'll do it very, very briefly. Women of the Wall, a group of women from all streams of Judaism, Orthodox, Conservative and Reform, who want to pray at the Western Wall, the holiest place to all Jews, pray in the women's section with what we call the four T's. The first T is the tefillah, the voice. And I was thinking yesterday, I don't know how many of you came to hear the wonderful presentation of uh, Glenn. He talked about the voice and he said something that is so right. He said, if we don't have a voice, we are not seen. We are, we're not there. We're, we're, and this is true about women as well. So at the Western Wall, okay, the men's section, the men pray out loud 
The women's section, we are expected to pray silently, okay? But women of the wall, don't pray silently. We come once a month on the first day of the Jewish uh, month, and we pray as a group, and we sing as part of the, of the, of the tefillah, of the prayer. And you can hear our voices. So this is the first team. Now, this has been going on for 34 years. 34 years we've been fighting. There's a long battle. So the first T is the tefillah. They don't want to hear our voice. I need to, to put something in brackets that I didn't say before, but it's important for understanding. In 1967, when the Western Wall was liberated, the government of Israel gave the running of the Western Wall to an ultra-Orthodox rabbi. Okay? It's a lifetime appointment. We are now on the second rabbi, and, and he answers to the prime minister, all right? But he runs the Western Wall like his own synagogue, okay? And the Western Wall, when I was a child, you know, the partition was this high. It is now very high. It's, it's changed. So when I say they don't want to hear us, it's the rabbi of the wall, and the ultra-Orthodox parties that are behind him and the chief rabbinate, they don't want to hear women praying. That's our first T. Our second T is the Talit. I was arrested four times at the West Wall. I'm a criminal. You can see it. I mean, it's obvious. So this is the women of the wall Talit. It says on the Atara, that's the top part, we embroidered a, a verse from the Song of Psalms, let me hear your voice because your voice is so melodic and you look so fair. We have the four mothers in the corners. Sarah, Rachel, Rivka and Leah. And I was arrested, as I said, four times for wearing this talit. So the policeman who was there said, you can wear the talitot, but you have to wear them like a scarf. Like so, like so, like a scarf. And while we're davening, you know, it kind of comes down and he would come to me and say, Leslie, Leslie, your talit, like a scarf, like a scarf. And one day I said, no more, no more. And I said to him, no. I said, I am, this is my talit. This is how I pray in my shul. I am not, it is not a scarf. No matter how many times you say it'll, it's a scarf, it's not a scarf. And, I'm, and I opened it and I put it as a talit and the others saw me and they did the same. And he said to me, I'm going to have to arrest you. And I said to him, you have to do what you have to do, but I have to do what I have to do. And I was arrested. I was arrested and fingerprinted and, uh, and mugshots taken and interrogated. And then they let me go. They let me go and I was arrested four times and many other women were arrested. Okay, it was me and, and another six, and then Anat Hoffman, my, my chairperson, and another five. It was always one of us and another group of women, even though we were sometimes 80 women with talitot. But it was always just a few of us. And the police were looking really bad with all these arrests, and no one knew what to do because these women were not giving up. And even one time when we came in, they confiscated our talitot. So the guys who come with us, they're quite a few men, um, they gave us their talitot. I mean, they couldn't win. We were not giving up. So um, after my, my fourth arrest, I was taken to court and the charge was disturbing the public peace. In Israel, you can arrest anyone, anywhere for disturbing the public peace. But within a certain amount of hours, you have to bring them in front of a judge and the judge will decide whether to lengthen the, the det detention um, in order to bring the per us, whoever it is, to trial or to let one go. And we were brought in front of a woman judge who let us go because she saw films of what happened there because it was being filmed. And she said, doesn't look to me like these women are disturbing the public peace. They are singing beautifully together, they're davening. It was the others, the men who were standing on the men's side on chairs, screaming at us. She said, they're disturbing the public peace. And we were let go. Um, and then the police decided to appeal to a higher court. Now this was, this was, you know, this was scary because 
In 1990, a year after women of the wall governed for the first time and got beaten up, the government of Israel passed a law. It's, an, it's another clause in the law of the holy places. There's a huge law that talks about the holy places for Christians and Jews and Muslims with many, many uh, uh, pieces to it, uh, what you're permitted to do, what you're not permitted to do, the money, whatever. They added a clause, which we call the Women of the World Clause, which says the following. Anyone who prays at the Western Wall, not according to the custom of the place, remember that sentence, um, and in a way that can offend others, can go to prison for up to six months or pay a fine. I don't know what the fine is because we wouldn't have paid it. Um, and this is the ch was the charge that we were taken to a higher court with. We had to have a criminal lawyer and I was sure I was going to prison because I wouldn't have paid the fine. I already agreed with my chairperson Anat that I would go to prison and I would demand a Torah and I would, I would do what's needed to make our voice heard there. Um, and I said goodbye to my husband and child and I said, look, I'm probably going to prison for a few months. And, um, and the judge who was, who was modern orthodox gave a, really a precedent-setting verdict, uh, which, changed, which changed everything. What he said was, who decides what the custom of the place is? Is it the rabbi of the wall? Or is it this group of women who've already been praying here for, then it was 24 years. He said, they are also the custom of the place. And in addition, offending the feelings of others, the 40s, I'm going to give you the last two in a minute, are all permitted within the halakha, that's the, the Jewish law, the, 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 the Jewish law that, that, that is, is behind the, what, how you pray at the Western Wall. Not wanting to hear women's voices, not letting them wear talitot or reading from Torah. That's our thir third uh, T, and that was my fifth arrest. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And the tefillin. Quite a lot of women nowadays wrap tefillin. So those are our 40s. All those things don't, don't appear in the halakha. There's nothing says there that women can't do them. These are interpretations of stricter and stricter uh, you know, leaders, ultra-Orthodox leaders. So the judge basically said, whatever they're doing is, is within halakha because we have Orthodox women with us. And we're praying in a women's group. So, and he said, the Declaration of Independence promises them freedom of religion and gender equality. They have no other alternative at the Western Wall. The only place that they can pray now is in the women's section. And since I've already said that they are praying, um, you know, according to the custom of the place, they are permitted to pray there with the 40s. This was a huge victory. I mean, the newspapers, the television, the, the, everything was full of women, women of the Wall's victory. And as a result of this victory, the Prime Minister realized that he had to find another solution and he convened a round table with the Rabbi of the Wall and representatives of all the streams, both in Israel and abroad. And what the decision that, that was uh, come to, the, the agreement, was turning an area which is the same wall, but it's not part of the now existing plaza, it's an archaeological area that you get to not through the, the same way that you get to the other two plazas, turning this area into an egalitarian prayer area. And it's brilliant because we're not taking anything from anyone because it's not used for prayer by the ultra-Orthodox. Of course, the moment, you know, the, the agreement was that we would get it, oh my God, of course, they want it, you know, they're not going to be permitted to, to have the, the Western Wall desecrated and so on and so forth. Government of Israel voted in 
favor of this pluralistic plaza in January of 2016. In June, in June of July, sorry, of, of 2016, Prime Minister Netanyahu came up uh, declaring that it's uh, void. The agreement is not going to be uh, followed through because the ultra-Orthodox parties uh, threatened to leave the coalition. So, the situation at the moment is that that area is, is used today for pluralistic prayer. There is a kind of a wooden, a wooden uh, floor, but it's, it's it looks terrible. It looks terrible, it's not that stable, but Israelis go and pray there. They pray there mainly for Bar Mitzvot and Bat Mitzvot. Why Bar Mitzvot? Because a lot of traditional Israelis want to have the son's Bar Mitzvah at the West Mall, but the women don't want to stand on a chair and look at their son. They want to stand beside their son or their grandson or their nephew. So it is used, it's also used by groups coming from abroad who want to pray together, men and women. Women of the wall continue praying in the women's section because we know that as long as we are there, they might turn the egalitarian section into something looking less like the back of the bus or a second-rate uh, prayer area for second-rate Jews and more like somewhere, you know, that we want to worship. So we continue praying in the women's section. The rabbi of the wall will not allow us to bring in a Torah scroll to the West Wall. They, they frisk us when we come in to check that we don't have anything on our body. I have smuggled in a Torah scroll many times in different very um, interesting ways. Um, but, um, but, you know, it's, it's uh, now the main section has 300. Any of you guys can just go up, Jewish, not Jewish, doesn't matter. You just go up and you take one and you can read it in the men's section. In the women's section, there's no Torah scrolls unless we manage to smuggle one in on Rosh Chodesh. Um, there's a lot of violence against us, a lot of violence against us. You can see some of the, um, what we go through. Um, on, on the Women of the Wall site and on our Facebook. There's uh, short films there and so on. You can see what we go through. Um, last month, I was here, this last Rosh Chodesh, uh, someone burnt one of our Sidurim. We have Women of the Wall Sidur, Sidur, that's the little prayer book, and someone burnt it, one of the ultra-Orthodox. Um, so so this, is, this is, now, why amongst other things am I telling you about Women of the Wall? Amongst other things, because there's, there's the ultra, in, in this new arsenal of legislation that's going to pass now, the ultra-Orthodox are demanding, and Netanyahu agreed, that they change the wording of that clause, pray uh, 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 the custom of the place. And it will say that the custom of the place of praying at the Western Wall will be determined by the chief rabbinate. Which means, you know, I might not come for some time to Australia, I'll be in prison when it passes, because we will carry on praying there. So, and we will be arrested, and we will probably go to prison. So this, this is something that, that is again connected to something that is, I, I think that the Women of the Wall's battle is one of the most interesting and successful <coughs> battles that combine women's rights and religious rights. Hmm? It is really, a, a, worldwide, I was invited a few years ago, uh, quite a few years ago now, to um, something that you might have heard of, the Parliament of, of Religions. It's the largest religious gathering in the world. And this woman wrote to me and said, uh, you know, would you come and speak? And I said, yeah, sure. It was in, uh, it was in Salt Lake City. Turned out that this woman was a Mormon, 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 a young woman. And when I arrived, she said, I can't believe that you're here. We worship you. You, you are our heroes. You know, these women who, who are trying to get into the room with the elders, you know, where they sit and they come and they knock and they say, can I come in? And the, whoever opens the door says no and closes the door. Now, if they do anything more than that, they'll be excommunicated. So they are really in a terrible bind. 
And the panel that I was, was, was at was so interesting. It was, it was this, it was a Mormon woman and there was a, there was a, this sounds weird, but a woman who is a Catholic um, a priest. She has a congregation. She was ordained on a ship with a, 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 a Catholic cardinal who ordains women. Nobody knows who he is, but, and, and she has a congregation. And, and, and she spoke, it was so interesting, and I won't go into it now, but it was fascinating. And there was this Muslim woman who also, they're trying to bring changes. So it, it, what I'm wanting to say is that the women of the world battle, being so successful, think about it. We can do three of the four T's at the moment, yeah? And we can do the fourth one if we get it in. Nobody can arrest us for reading it because, but we just can't get it in. And, and we have really um, brings, brought such change to the whole issue of women and religion in, in Israel. When we started off, when, 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 when the first arrests, you know, women who aren't reform or conservative had never seen women with talitot. But the media was full of us with talitot being arrested, okay? But the image of women with talitot, Israelis now are used to it. It's not so strange to them. They think, okay, a woman with talit, you know, that's, that's okay. Uh, maybe not my way, but... Um, the, so we have changed so much as far as in, in that issue of women and, um, and religion. Uh, a few more words, and, and then I'll, I'll open it up to questions about, um, about the new legislation. Um, one, another really, really bad thing that's going to happen with this new legislation is that they are going to give the rabbinical courts more uh, authority. They will able to be, now I told you, they can only deal with issues of marriage, divorce, and, uh, and property uh, settlements during marriage and uh, divorce. Um, and the new legislation brought by the ultra-Orthodox uh, parties will include, um, a, it will, will widen the range of topics that they will be permitted to, to uh, deal with. So for instance, now it does say that both par parties need to agree to go to the rabbinical courts, but if you are even a religious woman and you're working, going to work somewhere, your employer can make you sign an agreement that if you have any disputes, it will go to the rabbinical courts. Now, you have to agree or you won't get the job or, you know, but if there is a dispute and it does go to the rabbinical courts, again, you're going to lose because you're a woman. There's no question about it. So this is really, really bad. And I need to also tell you, as someone who's been through the rabbinical courts, it's, it's a farce. They don't always have um, minutes of the previous meeting. So, you know, it like starts afresh each time. It, uh, I don't know, I, when I was there, one of them was partially deaf. And then you had to shout in his ear. It's, it, it's not a court of law like, like we know. And, and people are, are going to have to, women are going to have to go there. Now, not only for their marriage and their, their divorce settlements, but for other things. This is, again, something really, really uh, bad. Um, I, uh, I'll also just mention that this government, this current government, um, um, has very few women in it, this coalition very few and uh, for instance executive directors of uh, of government offices there are 35 of them and um, one is a woman now in the previous government um, there was uh, I think about 40 percent women of, of the executive directors of the um, I won't I, Again, it, it's difficult to, to bring in all, all the you know, other minorities. You talked about other minorities, but I, 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 needless to say that this, all this new legislation is going to be tremendously harmful for, for any minority, any minority. LGBTQ, they're talking about conversion, uh, uh, conversion um, uh, you know, allowing conversion again. Terrible, 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 uh, uh, you know, uh, 
things we, we our our in this last government, which was a really good government, short but lot, the minister of health was uh, was gay, and he brought so much change in, really good change, for treatments for transgenders, for for he managed to pass a law forbidding um, conversion therapy. Okay, now they call it other things. They still do it. They call it other things, but they're going to make it legal again. This government is going to make it legal again. Um, I didn't talk about. Um, maybe I'll just mention it. Um, um, the issue of violence against women. Um, there was a law that that was already that was supposed to pass now. You know, um, for. Um, an electronic uh, bracelet for um, violent men against their wives, you know, but, um, and and it was was not passed. This government decided that you know it's okay to be violent. I, I, I don't know what they decided, but it, it it didn't pass. Israel was supposed to sign. We, we were a week away from signing a treaty, a very interesting treaty, by the way, called the Istanbul uh, Treaty, dealing with violence against women. And the reason uh, this government decided not to sign it is because in this very long treaty that Israel was supposed to sign, um, there was, a, there was a, a, a part there that talked about education for gender equality. This government is, is opposed to that. So we're not in a good place as far as women go in Israel. But I do want to end it on a, on a high note and tell you that um, I'm looking at the civil civil revolt in Israel, which is amazing. It is not organized. There's no one standing above it. It's it come down from it came down from the bottom. There are quite a lot of women leaders there, awesome women leaders. I've never heard their name before, but now they they're they're in the forefront. Um, and there are groups like a, a group called Building an Alternative, a group of Again, women it was not a large organization or anything, but what they started doing was they started um, uh, invited women to come and dress as handmaids uh, from the Handmaid's Tale, Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale. I, sorry, I went in the first group that dressed up like that. It was a very difficult experience because the, the hat, you know, covers your eyes completely, that cap. You can't see anything except for the feet of the person before. You have no idea where you are. You're kind of led. It's, it's, but it's been happening all over Israel. Thousands of women, they, they bring the costume, by the way. You don't have to see. Thousands of women all around Israel are wearing the, the cloaks and the hats and, and even now demonstrating just with a, rough, a red shirt talking about women's rights. So that is something that I think is really positive. The awareness of, of how, how easy it is to take away our rights and how important these rights are for us as women is something that, that, um, that is really um, so, so um, it brings me so much, so much happiness to see that awareness. And that, with that, I will end. And so if you have any questions, comments, ideas of smuggling in the Torah, yeah. Um, well, I'm very curious about that. But uh, first, I want to commend you, and I think what the work that you're doing is, is amazing. Thank you for enlightening us. Um, there was a throwaway line, I think, but it actually struck a chord with me, which I really wanted to elaborate on, which is when you said, in the men's section, even non-Jewish men are allowed to touch the Torah, but in the women's section, the Jewish women aren't. How do you think that whoever's in charge of that justifies that even to themselves? Let alone, do you know, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that that, that, that is acceptable in, in a society that's supposed to, you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area that's run by, by, by an unorthodox rabbi. How is that acceptable and women are not acceptable? It, you know, I, I think that is one of the the, the lesser curios, uh, curiosities because they don't they don't check the men that walk walk in. They don't look if they're Jewish or not. You put on a, a head a, a hat and you're in, and so they don't ask you why you're Jewish, not Jewish. I don't even think that they think about it because, again, it's um, 
I, I don't think it's even in their in their. They thought, I think there are much worse things there happening there, um, like uh, like uh, pushing us and, and and spitting at us and sure. and with, they bring whistles to. Sure, so, sure, sure. And on Rosh Chodesh. But, but the real question is why do they care? That's that's what I'm really asking. Because why do they care? They, that you do what you think and they do their thing. There's a separation anyway. What's the, what's the difference? Again, if because only... his his synagogue, the Rabbi of the world, his synagogue, women are not seen. They, they don't exist. They don't have a voice. They don't the but they don't. Sorry? On this section of the wall, they don't either. But they hear us. If we pray out loud, they can hear us. And the first years, the main complaint was about the voice that they hear us. They don't want to hear us. And on Rosh Chodesh, the, 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 the day we. At 7 o'clock in the morning, we go praying. In the men's section, there are these huge loudspeakers that are put up just on that day. They turn towards us, and there's a man, Chazan, Rabbi, who, who's reciting the prayer to drown our voice. They don't want to hear women's voices. They don't want to see women. They don't want women to be to be present in in, in this realm of 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 uh, being leaders in religion. And and I think that that we understand. We can understand. Why? That's giving up power. And they don't want to give up any power, especially not to women. So, it, to me, it, it make, nothing makes sense, but I can understand why they're doing it. It's part of this power struggle more than anything else. I've, I've done a thank you to you uh, a few times. Uh, Leslie's been here, the speaker, uh, fundraising. Uh, for the uh, Progressive Appeal, and um, although I have heard you many times, uh, and I've heard the stories many times, it still makes my blood boil, and it still infuriates me that this is still, in 2023, allowed to happen. Um, and you think about it in our context in Australia, and you could imagine an ultra-religious, one nation group controlling uh, what goes on in politics here and you can see what that equivalent but the groundswell last sunday night uh, when netanyahu dismissed the defense minister uh, hundreds of thousands of people came out of their homes at 11 o'clock at night midnight uh, and it was just amazing we thank you. We thank you for your passion, uh, for your endurance, uh, and we particularly thank you for your 